This time in Eye on Yellow Fever, we report on the fight against the biggest ongoing series of yellow fever outbreaks. We are currently working with 13 countries, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, CAR, Chad, Côte d'Ivoire, Congo, DRC, Ghana, Gabon, Niger, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. As we record this episode, it's July 2022. Since early last year, countries across Africa have been facing repeated yellow fever outbreaks. Case numbers are growing, and there have been dozens of deaths. There's a number of vulnerable people in countries, especially countries that have not conducted preventive mass vaccination campaigns in the last years. So it makes these people vulnerable and susceptible for any outbreak. It can be at home at work, at school, as the field, everywhere. Our concern or our job is to make sure that the target we receive these vaccines. In this episode, we're with two people coordinating this complex multi-country response, working to contain the virus. The risk of outbreaks of the deadly disease yellow fever is both significant and growing. This is down to a cocktail of contributing factors, including climate change and increasing pressure on land, greater movement of people, particularly into cities, and a resurgence in a highly connected world of the mosquito species that carries and transmits the disease. Yellow fever may not be the most obvious global public health threat, but it's a disease with no cure and a growing risk that must be taken seriously. We are Eliminate Yellow Fever Epidemics, that's I for short. From the world's most senior public health experts to those on the front line of combating this deadly disease wherever it emerges, we have the inside story on yellow fever's expanding global risk. This is I on Yellow Fever. Hello and welcome back to I on Yellow Fever. This is Ines Hamem from the World Health Organization's Emergency Response Communications Team. As we publish this episode in July 2022, there is a worrying and complex multi-country series of yellow fever outbreaks across Africa. We're joined this time by two people coordinating the region's efforts to bring the disease under control. I'm Dr. Ado Boaga. I'm a medical doctor by training, by profession, and I'm a epidemiologist, expert. I'm the team leader of the expanded program on immunization and vaccine preventable disease programs for the sub-regional office of WHO in Africa. For yellow fever, an incident management structure team, IMST, was established in December 2021, and I'm the incident leader. My name is Dr. Diallo Hadiatu. I'm a public health physician from Guinea. I'm currently a WHO consultant responsible for immunization within the yellow fever IMST. We'll hear more from Dr. Diallo in the second half of the episode. And right from the start, we have an important piece of technical language to unpack. Dr. Diallo and Dr. Bwaka are leaders within the IMST that was set up to tackle these yellow fever outbreaks. That's short for Incident Management Support Team. It's a specific emergency response structure used by the WHO in humanitarian and disaster response. A team is deployed with the range of skills needed and known processes to tackle the emergency at hand. Importantly, this is the first time ever that an IMST has been used to tackle yellow fever across so many countries, with outbreaks reported in the same time period. The IMST is um, organized in such a way that there are different positions and staff. Some of them were redeployed from the regional office or from other country offices, and some of them are consultants that have been recruited some of them are epidemiologist experts, some are vaccination experts, some are risk communication and community engagement experts. All these people are in country supporting the government to implement activities aimed at 
stopping the transmission of the virus and uh, controlling these outbreaks. Uh, Dr. Brockett, the region is also facing a number of other emergencies like COVID-19. There was Ebola. There were other arboviral diseases. How do you then decide, if you have multiple emergencies, who then decides what the priority is? Yeah, the, the continent is facing so many um, priorities at, at the same time. It's a challenge, but we are navigating between these priorities to make sure that none of them is left out, is left beyond. As we know, at the same time, COVID-19 was killing people. Vaccine-preventable disease did not go to sleep, so there were also outbreaks going on, measles, yellow fever, polio, and the rest. So it's challenging, of course, because sometimes these are the same people in the field that need to work towards uh, responding to these many outbreaks at the same time. So if you had one key piece of advice or one key lesson learnt about this IMSD for yellow fever, it does serve as a case study or lessons learnt for future yellow fever IMSDs that may need to be established? The early establishment of the IMSD of the start of these epidemics is, is one key lesson that we, we should learn and we should consider. And then provision or deployment of skilled staff, experts, was very key to the establishment of this IMST. This won't be news to you if you've listened to previous episodes of the podcast, but when it comes to yellow fever, a timely and expert response saves lives. Setting up an IMST is no different. The range of the skilled experts that were deployed in the IMST, I think the collaboration has been so strong and it has allowed us to provide the necessary support to, to countries. So my team is actually providing the support to the 17 countries in West Africa. So this expertise was leveraged to extend the support to countries even beyond West Africa. The other thing we can also mention is the International Coordination Group, ICG, which manages the global stockpile of yellow fever vaccines. Requests were made in a very rapid manner to get their approval and get the vaccines and the operational funds sent to countries a little bit faster than what we had previously. Dr. Baka says this speed of request is mainly thanks to the IMSC, a structure the I partnership helped to set up in December 2021. The list of countries affected is long. It includes Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, Côte d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ghana, Kenya, Niger, Nigeria, and others. There have been dozens of deaths. Could you just uh, tell me a little bit more about how the outbreak was able to spread so quickly? Why do you think the main reason was that the outbreak started in one country and then very quickly spread to, to a number of different countries? What I can say first is that, you know, one of the strategies to prevent yellow fever outbreaks is to increase routine immunization coverage. Routine immunization refers to planned and scheduled vaccination campaigns across entire populations, from babies to adults. I don't think we have yet reached the optimal coverage, minimum of 80% coverage for, for all countries in the region, to make sure that we prevent the occurrence of uh, outbreaks. So there's a number of uh, susceptible, vulnerable people in countries, especially countries that have not conducted preventive mass vaccination campaigns in the last years. So it makes these people vulnerable and susceptible for any outbreak. Of course, children that are not vaccinated are also prone to these outbreaks. If you add to that displacement of population, the fact that some areas are not reached with the vaccines. So these are some of the factors that contribute to the spread and increase of uh, of the number of cases. Some of these countries are actually classified as fragile, conflict-affected or vulnerable countries. What is it that's important to understand about the spread of yellow fever in countries that are affected by conflict or otherwise fragile? You mentioned low immunization rates. Are there any other factors to take into account in these uh, conflict-affected or fragile countries? Yes, those countries that are affected by conflict 
are actually facing a kind of humanitarian crisis. There are populations that are internally displaced or populations that are becoming refugees. Access to these areas is also difficult because of the security um, challenges. It makes it very difficult for the routine immunization service delivery to be provided to these areas. You have challenges in terms of road access, you have challenges in terms of security, you have challenges in terms of providing resources that are needed to transport vaccines to those areas. So this contributes to the fact that uh, this population has not optimally reached with, uh, with the vaccines. I can mention Ghana as one of the examples. The outbreak, the yellow fever outbreak that um, occurred in Ghana was actually in one of the nomadic communities. And the place was hard to reach and difficult to, to access. So the government of Ghana took upon itself to use helicopters, army helicopters, to convey the vaccines to those areas. These are vaccines that were actually in stock in the country before even the ICG could deploy the vaccines in country. So these vaccines were transported by helicopter, army helicopter, to those communities. And these nomadic communities were reached with, with these vaccines. This is just an example. I think we also have examples in some other countries like Chad, Central Africa Republic, where we have nomadic populations. And especially in Central Africa Republic, some areas that are being affected by conflict, but some innovative strategies were put in place to ensure that vaccines reach these communities and get these communities to get vaccinated. It has been tough, but we have very motivated people at the IMST. People are excited to, to give their best. My, my colleagues have been very extraordinary and strong and very available to provide this support. It's also one of our strengths to face challenges and make sure that we provide the support that countries are in need of. So, so that's what I, I can say. I think the, the team is very motivated. With many thanks to Dr. Ado Bwaka. Soon, we'll be joined by the IMST's lead on vaccination response. As we know by now, getting people immunized is the single most important part of protecting people against the yellow fever virus. You're listening to Eye on Yellow Fever from the Global Coalition of Partners working together to end yellow fever epidemics by 2026. This is episode 16, meaning there is now a wealth of previous episodes for you to go and find in your podcast player. If you're discovering us for the first time, please go ahead and give them a listen. We'd also love for you to spread the word about the podcast. Please recommend us to friends or colleagues you think would be interested in learning more about yellow fever or have an interest in infectious diseases. You can also subscribe to the podcast so new episodes are always automatically downloaded to your device. For this second half of the episode, we've heard from her briefly earlier, but it's time to properly meet Dr. Hadiatu Diallo and to focus on the important topic of yellow fever vaccination. Our team is multidisciplinary and draws on a range of technical expertise such as laboratory, surveillance, international control, data management, immunization with IFE surveillance, risk communication, planning and information, all under the coordination of the IMST, of the incident manager and incident leader who provide leadership coordination of the activities under each pillar. This structure with varying competencies allow us to support the country concerned in order to contain the outbreaks of yellow fever and limit the propagation. Dr. Diallo, you are leading on the vaccinations for the yellow fever outbreaks. We'd like to get a sense of what that actually means in real life, your, your day-to-day. Take us on a virtual tour of what your work is like or a normal day. Okay, uh, yes, I'm leading immunization within the team and my work consists to collaborating with the country concerned by the outbreak to identify the gaps 
and needs in immunization to provide my support in drawing up the request for vaccines, to follow up on the provision of the vaccine and fund for vaccination implementation. We mentioned them earlier. These requests for vaccine supply go to the International Coordination Group on Vaccine Provision, or ICG, the group that manages the global stockpile of yellow fever vaccines. When the requests were approved by the ICG, and then to follow up and support the preparation, the implementation, and at the end, the evaluation of the vaccination campaign, is therefore a matter of coordinating and supporting the entire vaccination chain as soon as a case of yellow fever is confirmed in a country to achieve goal three of the I strategy, which is to contain rapidly the yellow fever outbreak. You're based in Burkina Faso, but your job obviously involves working with a lot of teams in a lot of affected countries. Yeah. That sounds like a big communication challenge. How do you make sure that you are talking to the people that you need to be talking to at the right time about the right things across all these different multiple countries across the region? Yes, as you say, you are, IMSC is based in Ouagadougou, but we are currently working with 13 countries, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Côte d'Ivoire, Congo, DRC, Ghana, Gabon, Niger, Nigeria, Kenya, and Uganda. To facilitate the working with them, we have classified these countries in two categories according to the level of priority. So, for example, we have the priority one, which are the countries that have declared the epidemic and therefore require a response in a short term. For example, Cameroon, CAR, Chad, Ghana. We have also priority two, which are countries that have notified confirmed case and for which close monitoring is being done to identify more evidences. For example, we have DRC, Congo, And then we have the priority two. That's the country where suspect cases are notified and for monitoring. We are following with them to strengthen the surveillance and to guide them for the next step. So, for example, we have Uganda, Nigeria, Niger. With all these countries, we are collaborating with the WHO country office. It can be the staff and also the consultant deployed to support yellow fever activities in country. So we can do it during our coordination meetings each Monday for French-speaking country and each Wednesday for English-speaking country to get some update from them, to orient them and to follow with them the response activities. When we want to know something from countries, we can call them by Teams, we can call them by WhatsApp. We have permanent contact with them to know how it's going on in the country and to know how we can provide more support to achieve our objectives. You mentioned the prioritizing the countries into two different categories. When it comes to deciding who gets vaccines, so you procure the vaccines and now you have to make a decision of who's going to actually get those vaccines. How is that decision made? Is it made on the scale of the outbreak or is it made on the immunity levels? How do you make a decision as to who gets the vaccines? That's a good question because yellow fever is one of the complex diseases. It's not like mathematically formed like one plus one is two. The first criteria is to confirm a case by PCR or PRNT, that means zero neutralization, by one of the regional reference lab. She's talking here about the different laboratory tests that can support diagnosis of yellow fever infection. You'll know this from our last but one episode, episode 14, when we visited Senegal's Institut Pasteur de Dakar, one of Africa's three yellow fever regional reference labs. The others are in Cameroon and Uganda. 
Only when a case is confirmed and supported with epidemiology evidence on the ground does an official response get triggered. Often, it's Dr. Diallo and colleagues who take the next course of action. So the first step is to conduct in deep investigation of this case when it will be confirmed. Organizing this investigation means to go to the fields around the case, around the environment of the case, and collecting additional information that will guide the next step. During this investigation, it will be necessary to look for additional suspect case at the level of the health facilities, to also check about suspect case around the case, to also collect blood samples from probable or suspect case that will be found during this investigation, to make a rapid risk assessment of vaccination coverage around the case, analyze the information on routine immunization in the health facilities, and to make an entomological assessment to verify the existence or not of the yellow fever vector, which is Aedes species. She's referring here to the Aedes aegypti mosquito, the main way yellow fever is rapidly spread in urban areas. Experts are sent in to assess for the presence of the mosquito and the likely conditions for it to breed and spread around the outbreak area. At the end of this stage, we are doing now an evaluation of the collective immunity based on the result of the rapid immunization assessment survey, the routine immunization coverage at the level of health facilities, but also at the level of district, doing also a basic analysis from previous health survey, such as demographic health survey, or multiple indicators, cluster survey, or WHO and UNICEF estimation that they made every year for each country, to also collect information about the previous organization of preventive or reactive campaign in this area. Like you will understand, you have a lot of things to analyze and then to say that, yes, we need here to organize a reactive campaign. With all these things happening in parallel, you start to see why a multidisciplinary response and a coordinated group of experts is essential. This list of things all need to be done as quickly as possible to provide the evidence of an outbreak to the International Coordination Group on Vaccine Provision so that they can release vaccine supplies. That actually does sound quite complex and challenging. Yes. I think one of the, the biggest challenges also then is making sure that those vaccines reach the people that need to be vaccinated, especially in a reactive campaign. What I want to highlight before is that vaccines are delivery wherever they are needs. The aim is to reach the targets wherever is it. It can be at home, at work, at school, as the field, everywhere. Our concern or our job is to make sure that the target we receive these vaccines. We heard earlier from Dr. Braca about Ghanaian authorities taking the initiative to transport vaccine supplies by military helicopter. Dr. Diallo says a similar mission, fraught with logistical and technical difficulty, is needed to reach outlying parts of the Central African Republic. Central African Republic is one of the countries who need to organize a campaign as soon as possible. So they have planned to organize this campaign in two weeks, but currently they are facing transportation of vaccine from Bangui, the capital of Ka, to Hobomu district, a very high difficult area to access, which are also a area with security challenges. The only option we had now is to do air transportation of the vaccine. But unfortunately, we don't have a fixed schedule of the flight. So the country, the government, as well as uh, partners, including WHO and UNICEF, are working very hard to find a way to get the vaccine to this area as soon as possible. I'm taking this example just to show you that you can receive the vaccine in the country, 
like in the capital, with no problems, but to take in this vaccine and send to the area, the, the concern area, you can face a lot of challenges and you need to identify the best way and to work together with all the partners to make sure that this vaccine will arrive yearly on this area and then you can conduct the vaccination campaign. And it is also good to highlight that, unfortunately, epidemics are tracked in areas that are either not very accessible or the area which have level, a high level of security or humanitarian challenges. Thank you. In my region, the Eastern Mediterranean region, we also have a lot of countries with very remote and hard to reach areas. We've heard some stories about how creative uh, the immunizers can be when it comes to trying to reach the people uh, with the vaccine. So we have immunizers who are riding donkeys with the ice boxes <laughs> that are carrying the vaccines or, you know, climbing up mountains. They're rowing small boats to try and get to the, the people in the villages that need to be vaccinated. So I think at some time you do need to be very creative in and, and how you get the vaccines to those people people. Yes, of course. So just another question for you, please. It's obviously a very challenging work. You've seen people be infected. You've seen severe illness. You've seen death. The people, unfortunately, that the vaccines maybe were not able to reach on time or were not able to save on time. Personally, how do you, how do you manage these feelings? How do you cope? Um, it's not really easy to respond to this question because it's always deplorable to see people suffering or dying for a disease that we can prevent. When we have the possibility to prevent a disease, but we are seeing persons suffering or dying for this disease, it's very difficult to, to explain it. In the case of yellow fever, only one dose of vaccine is sufficient and can protect for the life. But for that, we need to administrate the vaccine. The vaccine is available. The vaccine is efficient and very efficacious. But we are seeing a lot of people who are not vaccinated and can be sick and then can die only because they didn't take one dose of vaccine. Here, for this current epidemic, according to the fatality rate, this epidemic have a fatality rate around 10%. So we need to really mobilize to continue to support the countries and to make sure that we cannot have death according to disease that we can prevent by vaccination. You can hear this really means a lot. It's something I think we all feel, those of us who are trying to get vulnerable people vaccinated around the world. We'll start to bring this episode to a close with a personal plea from Dr. Diallo, a plea from the front line of tackling yellow fever outbreaks. The first thing I can ask for is to consider that yellow fever is an emergency like the other diseases. Because the example we are seeing currently in this yellow fever epidemic is that the countries or people are not taking account yellow fever concern like the other diseases. But I think the first thing I can push for is to take very uh, serious yellow fever concerns. One last question from my side, Dr. Diallo, is we've talked about some of the pressures that you face personally. I want you now to give us a sense of what makes you satisfied in your job. What makes you feel that you can go home and say, today was a good day. Something has been achieved. We've contributed to saving lives, uh, reducing infection. What gives you that sense of personal satisfaction? Um, I can say that a lot of things, you know, it will be when I see the vaccine arrive in the country. When I see the picture of the people holding the vaccination cards, that means they are vaccinated. So that means they receive the vaccine that provide to the country. When I see the decline of the epidemiological curve, that means that the reduction of 
the probable and confirmed case, I can say that yes, what we are doing is good and we have some results. And then I can have a small smile and say to myself that yes, we have add value of what we are doing and we have been able to contain the epidemic and we can hope that eliminating yellow fever epidemic in Africa will be a long process, but we will get, we will get it. A really inspiring way to finish this episode from Dr. Hadiato Diallo, the vaccination lead on yellow fever in West Africa. Huge thanks again to her, and thanks again to Dr. Adu Bwaka, who we heard from in the first part of this episode. An important reminder before we leave you is that word of mouth is so important when it comes to reaching new audiences with podcasts. So if you have colleagues or friends who you think would find this episode useful or interesting, please let them know about us by sending them a link. You can select subscribe or follow to make sure that all future episodes of Ion Yellow Fever are automatically downloaded directly to your device. Thank you for being with us. This episode was produced by Dave Howard with research from Liv Facey and sound design by Adam Whaley. I'm Ines Hamem. Eye on Yellow Fever is a Bengo media production for the Eliminate Yellow Fever epidemic strategy. 